Yeah. Rolling. Yeah. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard Ken Burton uh, present about the biographies of many of the most distinguished and significant scientific figures in astronomy's history. For this biographical presentation, he's actually going to one of the most influential and impactful uh, pairs of brothers in animation history. So the, he's going to be talking about the Fleischer brothers and he'll say more about them in a minute. Ken has been a member of the club for going on 20 years, I believe, and served for four years as president and first vice president. And he's uh, involved in uh, many aspects of the club, from in the news to getting snack volunteers. So, without further ado. Strong arming snack volunteers. Strong arming <laughs> snack volunteers. So, without further ado, I give you Ken Burton. Popeye and Superman in cartoon form, uh, one of the innovators of, of um, animation through many, many years. Uh, he is my great uncle. Uh, I met him, his, his, his um, wife was uh, my mother, grandmother's sister, and um, I had the fortune of meeting him when I was 11 years old. So I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go through it. I met Uncle Max at my cousin Manny's bar mitzvah in 1957 when I was 11 years old. Max obviously had a great affection for children and he started to ask me questions and quickly discovered of my great interest in astronomy. To my surprise, he said that astronomy was his hobby as well. Um, we communicated, uh, we talked the whole evening at the party, probably two, two and a half hours about astronomy. Um, uh, we communicated by mail and phone until his passing in 1972. I remember his first question to me about astronomy, which may have been the catalyst by, of even more intense passion for astronomy by me, even though I had started studying it some six years prior to our meeting. He said, why is it colder at the top of a mountain than at its base? I'll get to that in a little while. Max was married to Essie, the sister of my grandmother, Bessie, who was my dad's mom. I am still a great friend of his granddaughter, Jeannie Mahoney. I do want to, first of all, thank uh, uh, Ray Pointer, who is his biographer, for giving me much of the material here. And I want to give a special thanks to Jonathan Cade, who helped me convert the pictures, uh, the, the cartoons you're going to see later in the presentation, uh, to be able to use them on the, the PowerPoint presentation. And thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, Max Fleischer was born Meyer Fleischer, July 19, 1883. Uh, was a Polish-American animator, inventor, film director, and producer. He was born in Krakow, Poland. Fleischer became a pioneer in the development of animated cartoon and served as the head of the Fleischer Studios, which he co-founded with his younger brother, Dave, in the United States. He brought such animated characters as Coco the Clown, Betty Boo, Popeye, and Superman to the movie screen, and was responsible for a number of technological innovations, including the rotoscope and the bouncing ball song films, and the stereotypical, the stereo optical process. Uh, film director Richard Fleischer, who directed 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, was his son. As said, Max was born in, in 1883 to the Jewish family in Krakow, then part of the Austrian-Hungarian province of Austria, Poland. He was the second of six uh, children of a tailor from Dubrowa Tarnowski, Aaron Fleischer, who later changed his name to William in the United States, and Malka Almelia Pelez. His family emigrated to the United States in March of 1887, settling in New York City, where he attended public school. During his early formative years, he enjoyed middle-class lifestyle, the result of his father's success as an 
exclusive tailor of high society clients. This changed drastically after his father lost his business 10 years later. His teens were spent in Brownsville, a poor Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn. He continued his education at evening in high school. He received a commercial art training at Cooper Union and formal art instruction at the Art Students League of New York, studying under George Bridgman. He also attended the Mechanics and Tradesmen School in Midtown Manhattan. <coughs> Fleischer began his career at the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, first as an Aaron Roy, was advanced to a photographer and photo engraver, and later a staff cartoonist. At first, he drew single pan panel editorial cartoons, then graduated to full strips. Little Algy and C.K. Sposher, the camera fiend, these satirical strips reflected his life in Brownsville and his fascination with technology and photography, respectively, both displaying his sense of irony and fatalism. He was during, it was during this period he met newspaper cartoonist and early animator John Randolph Bray, who would later give him his start in the animation field. On December the 25th, 1905, he married his childhood sweetheart, Ethel Essie Goldstein. He, on the recommendation of Bray, Fisher was hired as a technical... Hold on a second. He was uh, hired as a technical, technical... Hold on a second. Sometimes these computers, like I said, I want to go back to rotary phones. Technical illustrator for the Electro Light Engraving Company in Boston. In 1909, he moved to Syracuse, New York, working as a catalog illustrator for the Krauss Heinz Company, and years later returned to New York as an art editor for Popular Science Monthly magazine under the editor, editor James McKean Cattrell and Scientific American editor Waldemir Kempfert. In 1914, he, the first commercially produced animated cartoons started to appear in movie theaters. They tended to be stiff and jerky. Fleischer devised an improvement in animation through a combined projector and easel for tracing images from live action film. This device, known as the rotoscope, enabled Fleischer to produce the first realistic animation since the initial works of cartoonist Windsor, Windsor McKay, uh, creator of Little Nemo. His patent uh, was granted in 1917, but prior to that, Max and his brother Joe and Dave Fleischer made their first series of tests between 1914 and 1916. The Path Exchange uh, was an independent American film production um, and distribution company from 1921 to 1927, offered Max his first opportunity as a producer due in part to the fact that Dave had been working there as a film cutter since 1914. Max chose a political satire of a hunting trip by Theodore Roosevelt. After several months of labor, the film was rejected, and Max was making uh, the rounds again when he was reunited, re reunited with John Bray at Paramount. Bray had a distribution contract with Paramount at the time and hired Max as production supervisor for his studio. With the outbreak of World War I, Max was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, by the way, I served at Fort Sill, by the way, just coincidentally, to produce the first Army training films on subjects that included contour map reading, operating of Stokes mortar, firing the Lewis machine gun, and the submarine mine laying. Following the Army, Fleischer returned to Bray and the production of the theatrical and educational films. Inkwell Studios. Fleischer produced his Out of the Inkwell films featuring the clown character, which originated with his youngest brother Dave, who had worked as a sideshow clown at Coney Island. It was a, one of the later tests made from footage of Dave as a clown that interested Bray. Fleischer's mutual, in, initial series was first produced at the Bray Studios and released as a monthly installment of the Bray Good, uh, Goldwyn pictograph screen magazine from 1919 to 1921. In, in addition to producing Out of the Inkwell, while production manager for Bray, he supervised a number of educational and technical films such as The Electric Bell, All Aboard for the Moon, and Hello Mars, the last two of which will, you will watch later in the presentation. It was uh, as production manager when Fleischer hired his first animator, Roland Crandall, who remained with him throughout the actively years of the, of the, hold it back, 
sorry. Come on. Okay, uh, Act of the Year's uh, 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 Fletcher Studio. Out of the Inkwell featured the novelty of combining live action and animation and served as it semi-documentaries with the appearance of Max Fleischer as the artist who dipped his pen into the ink bottle to produce the clown figure on his drawing board. While the technique of, of combining animation with live action was already established by others at the Bray Studio, it was Fleischer's clever use of it, combined with Fleischer's unrealistic animation, that made his series unique. In 1921, Max and Dave established Out of the Inkwell Films, Incorporated, and continued production of Out of the Inkwell through various distributors. The clown had no name until 1924 when Dick Humor uh, joined the company after animating early Mutt and Jeff cartoons. He redesigned the clown and named him Coco. Humor additionally created Coco's canine uh, companion known as Fritz and moved the Fleischer away from their dependency on the rotoscope for fluid animation, leaving it for special uses and reference points where co co uh, compositing uh, was uh, composition was, was involved. Because Max valued Humor's work, he instructed Humor to make just the key poses and employ an assistant to fill in the remaining drawings. Max assigned Art Davis as Humor's assistant. By the way, these names are seen through animation for years and years and years. The Disney Studio people, these are all very famous animators that I'm mentioning here, so they're just not names. Um, and uh, he assigned Art Davis as the assistant and was beginning of the animation position of in-betweener, in-betweener, um, and uh, uh, hold on a second. Uh, okay, and which uh, was essentially uh, another Fleischer invention that resulted in an efficient production and was adopted by the entire industry by the early 1930s. It was during this time that Max developed the rotograph, a means of photographing live action film footage with animation cells for a composite image. This was an improvement over the method used by Brain where a series of 8 by 10 inch stills were made for motion picture film and used as backgrounds behind animation cells. The rotograph technique went more, uh, into more general use as aerial image photo photography and was a staple of in animation and optical effects companies for making titles and various forms of matte comp composites. In addition to the theatrical comedy films, Fleischer produced technical and educational films including The Little Big Fellow and Now You're Talking to for AT&T. In 1923, he made two minute features explaining Al Albert Einstein's theory of relativity and Charles uh, Darwin's evolution using animated special effects with live action. By the way, those are two 20 minutes and you saw the one when you were at the break of, of uh, theory of relativity. There he is. <coughs> and there's a picture of Dick Humor and Roland Doc Crandall and, um, and also Art Davis. In 1924, Fleischer partnered with Edwin Miles Friedemann, Hugo Reisenfeld, and Lee DeForest, he's known as the father of radio, to form the Red Seal Pictures Corporation, which owned 36 uh, theaters on the East Coast, Coast and a couple in Cleveland. During this period, Fleischer invented the follow the bouncing ball technique in his Coco song cartoon series and animated song along, song, sing along shorts. In these films, the lyrics of the song appeared on the screen and theater patrons are encouraged to sing along with the characters and an animated ball bounces across the top of the lyrics to indicate when words should be sung. Song Cartoons 12 used the DeForest Photofield sound on film process. My Old Kentucky Home in 1926 was the first using the system. This preceded Walt Disney's Steamboat Willie in 1928, which has been erroneously cited for decades as the first ca cartoon to synchronize sound with animation. The Song Cartoons series lasted until early 1927 and were interrupted by the bankruptcy of Red Seal Company just five months before the start of the sound era. Yeah. Alfred Weiss, owner of the aircraft pictures, approached Fleischer with a contract to produce cartoons for Paramount. Due to the legal complications of the bankruptcy, the Out of the Equal series 
was renamed the Inkwell Imps and ran from 1927 to 1929. This was the start of Fleischer's relationship with the huge Paramount organization which lasted the next 15 years. After a year, the Fleischer brothers started experimenting mis uh, exper experiencing mismanagement under Weiss and left the company in late 1928. Inkwell Films Incorporated filed bankruptcy in January of 1929 and Fleischer formed Fleischer Studios Incorporated in March of that year. Fleischer first set up operations at Carpenter Golden Laboratories in, Laboratories in Queens with a small staff. Uh, after eight months, his new company was solvent enough to move back to its former location at 1600 Broadway in New York, where it remained until 1938. While with Carpenter Goldman, Fleischer started producing industrial films, including Finding His Voice in 1929, a demonstration film illustrating the Western Electric variable density sound recording and reproduction method. In spite of conflicts with Weiss, Fleischer managed to negotiate a new contract with Paramount to produce a revised version of the song car tunes, renamed Scream Songs, produced with sound beginning in the, on the, uh, with the sidewalks of New York. Sidewalks of New York. During, the early in, in, during, during this early in the sound era, Fleischer produced many technically advanced films that were a result of his continued research and development that perfected the post-production method of sound recording. Several of these devices provided visual cues for the musical conductor to follow. His dialogue and songs became major elements. More precise analysis of soundtracks was possible uh, through other inventions from uh, Fleischer, such as the cue meter. Max Fleischer's most famous character, Betty Boop was born out of a cameo caricature in an early talk, uh, talker tune, uh, Dizzy Dishes, um, the, uh, in 1930. Fashioned after popular figure, singer Helen Kane, she originated as, after, uh, she, uh, she originated as a hybrid poodle canine figure and was such a sensation in the New York Preview that Paramount encouraged Fleischer to develop her into a continuing character. While she originated under the veteran animator Myron Grimm, uh, Natwick, she was transformed into a human female under Seymour Nightel and Bernie Wolf and became Fleischer's biggest character. Uh, Seymour Nightel was his son-in-law um, who married uh, my cousin Ginny. Anyway, that's, uh, no, his, Ginny's mother, Ruth. Okay, anyway, everything's relative. Uh, the Betty Boop series began in 1932 and became a big success for Fleischer. The same year, Helen Kane filed a suit against Fleischer, <coughs> Fleischer Studios, and Paramount, claiming that the cartoon was a deliberate caricature of her, of her, created unfair competition, and had ruined her career. The suit went to trial in 1934, an early, an, an early sound test film of, the, of an obscure black performer, Baby Esther Jones, was shown as key evidence disproving Kane's claim, claims as an originator of the same style. Uh, a judge ruled that the plaintiff has failed to sustain either cause or action by proof of sufficient prob probative, probative force, in his opinion, the baby technique of singing did not originate with Kane. So he escaped a bullet, as they say. Fleischer's greatest business decision came with his licensing of the comic strip character Popeye the Sailor who was introduced to audiences in Betty Boop's short, cartoon short, Popeye the Sailor, in 1933. Popeye became a box office hit and was one of the most successful screen adaptions of comic strip in cinema history. Much of this success was due uh, the perfect match of the Fleischer studio style combined with its unique use of music. By the late 1930s, a survey indicated that Popeye had eclipsed Mickey Mouse in popularity, challenging Disney's presence in the market. During the scene uh, by the mid, uh, during its scene in the mid 1930s, Fleischer Studios uh, was producing four series: Betty Boop, Popeye, Screen Songs, and Color Classics, resulting in 52 releases each year. From the very beginning, Fleischer's business relationship with Paramount was a joint financial and distribution arrangement, making his studio a service company supplying product for the company's theaters. During the Great Depression, Paramount went through four bankruptcy reorganizations which affected their operational expenses. As fighting member of the Society of Motion Picture Engineers, Fleischer was aware of the technical advances of the industry, particularly in the development of color cinematography. Due to Paramount's financial restructuring, he was unable to acquire 
of the three color technical process from the start. This created an opportunity for Walt Disney, who was then a small fledging producer, to acquire a four year exclusivity. With this, he created a new market for colored cartoons beginning with flowers and trees in 1932. In 1934, Par Paramount approved color production for Fleischer, but he was left with a limited two color process of Cinecolor and two color uh, Technicolor for the first year of the color classics. The first entry, Poor Cinderella in 1934, was made in the two emulsion, two color Cinecolor process and starred <laughs> Betty Boop in her only color appearance. By 1936, Disney exclusively Exclusivity had expired, and Fleischer had the benefit of the three-color technicolor process, beginning with Play Safe. These color cartoons were often augmented with Fleischer's patented three-dimensional effects, promoted as the stereotypical process, uh, stereo-optical process. I'm sorry, a precursor to Disney's multi-plane animation. This technique used 3D model sets, replacing flat plane pan backgrounds, and with animation cells. Uh, photographed in front. This technique was used to the greater degree in the two real Popeye features, Popeye the Sailor meets Sinbad the Sailor in 1936, and Popeye the Sailor meets all ba Alibaba's 40 Thieves in 1937. These double-length cartoons demonstrated Fleischer's interest in the animated feature films. While Fleischer petitioned for this for three years, it was not until the New York opened the Radio City of Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in February of 1938. <coughs> uh, that Paramount executives realized the value of animated features and ordered one for a 1939 release. The popularity of Popeye cartoons created demand for more. To meet Marriott's demands, the studio was challenged with rapid expansion, production speed ups, and crowded working conditions. Finally, in May of 1937, Fleischer Studios was affected by a five month strike resulting in a boycott that kept the studio's releases off theaters, <coughs> off theaters um, uh, until November. Max, having a paternal attitude toward his employees, took it personally and as if he had been betrayed and developed an ulcer. Following the strike, Max and Dave Fleischer decided to move the studio for more space to escape further uh, labor agitation. In March of 1938, Paramount approved Max's proposal to produce the feature just when he was preparing to move the studio from New York to, to Miami. Once in Miami, uh, relations between Max and Dave began deteriorating, starting with the pressures to deliver their first <coughs> feature, complicated further by Dave's adulterous affair with his secretary, May Schwartz. Everything is relative, and let me stop, tell you all about those relatives. As they say. <laughs> Jonathan Swift's classic, Gulliver's Travel, was a favorite of Max's, and Preston's production. Uh, Fleischer and Paramount originally budgeted <coughs> $500,000 and came uh, the same miscalculation made by Disney with Snow Wright. The final cost of Gulliver's Travel was three times with $1.5 million. It played limited engagements in only 30 theaters during the Christmas season in 1939 and made $3 million, giving Paramount a profit of $1.5 million before going into foreign release. But Fleischer Studios was penalized $350,000 for going over budget, and the contact did not allow Max and Fleischer Studios' participation in the foreign earnings. This was the beginning of financial difficulties for, of Fleischer Studios and reduced royalties due to his debt to Paramount. In 1940, Max was relegated uh, business, uh, relegated business affairs and continued technical development. Um, his uh, uh, efforts resulted in a reflex camera viewfinder and a line transfer method to replace the time-consuming and tedious process of cell inking. That same year, Fleischer and Paramount experienced lost revenues due to the failure of a new series called Gabby, Animated Antics, and Stone Age, all launched under the leadership of Dave. After Republic Studios allegedly failed to develop Superman as a live action series serial. Max acquired the license that fall and initiated development. The cost of the Superman series has been grossly overstated for decades based on Dave Fleischer's 1968 interview. The actual figures stated in Fleischer's contract was in the $30,000 range, twice the cost of a Popeye cartoon. Superman was a reflection of the type of serious cartoons that were not being made by rival studios. 
Their science fiction fantasy elements appeal to Max's interest, uh, finally leading th the studio into maturity and relevance in the 1940s. The early returns on Gulliver prompted <coughs> Paramount's president, Barney Balaban, to order a second feature uh, for their 1941 Christmas release. This second feature, Mr. Bug Goes to Town, was unique, having a contemporary setting and was technically superior to Gulliver's Travels. Paramount had high hopes for its Christmas of 1941 release, which was well received by critics during the, its December 5th preview. However, the exhibitors rejected it, fearing it would not do business, and that with the bombing of Pearl Harbor two days after the preview, the original Christmas release was canceled. With the cancellation of the release of Mr. Buck Goes to Town, Max was called to a meeting <coughs> excuse me, with Balaban in New York, where he, with, he asked him for his resignation. Dave had resigned the month before, following the completion of the post-production on the film. Paramount finished out the remaining five months of the 1941 Fleischer contract with the absence of both Max and Dave. And the ch change to famous studios became official on May 27, 1942. Paramount installed new management, and among them, Max's son-in-law, Seymour Nactel. In 1940, Max was relegated to business affairs and continued again technical de development. His efforts resulted in the reflex camera. It says that, I already did that, I'm sorry. Cost of Superman, that's too much too, sorry about that. Sometimes these are duplicated. We've had some problems with the computers, by the way, so. Okay, moving on. Uh, by the way, there's a picture of Seymour Nactel and his family right there. Uh, Seymour, unfortunately, died at the age of 56 from uh, a heart attack uh, and uh, because he smoked uh, cigarettes continuously. He used to have a cigarette lit. I actually remember this. He'd have a cigarette lit there and then he'd light another one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unable to form a studio for the demand for military training films, Fleischer was brought in as head of the animation department for the industrial film country, the Jim Handy Organization in Detroit, Michigan. Surprise, about that. While there, he supervised the technical and cartoon animation departments, producing training films for the Army and the Navy. Fleischer was also involved with top secret research and development for the war effort, including an aircraft bombing sighting system, bomber sighting system. In 1944, he published Noah's Shoes, a metaphoric account of the building and loss of his studio, casting himself as Noah. Following the war, he supervised the production of the animated adaption of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, sponsored by Montgomery Ward in 1948, animated short film produced and directed by Max Fleischer based on the 1939 Robert L. Mack May poem, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, after a, fly, after a flying reindeer of one of Santa Claus. The eight-minute animated interpretation of the Christmas poem preceded Gene Autry's 1949 song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <coughs> Fleischer left Handy in 1953, returned to production manager for the Bray Studios in New York, where he developed an educational television pilot about unusual birds and animals titled, Imagine That. Fleischer won his lawsuit against Paramount in 1955 over the removal of his name from the credits of his films. While Fleischer had issues over the breach of contract, he avoided suing for a decade to protect his son-in-law, Seymour Nitel, who was lead director at Paramount's famous studios. In 1958, Fleischer revived Out of the Equal Films and partnered with his former animator, Hal Seeger, to produce 100 color Out of the Equal uh, cartoons for television. This is 1960-61. <coughs> Actor Larry Storch performed the voices for Coco and supporting characters mm -hmm. Coconut and Mean Mo. While Max appeared in an unaired pilot, he became too ill to appear in the series and while in poor health, spent the rest of his life, regaining ownership of Betty Boo. Fleischer, along with his wife, Essie, moved to the Motion Picture County Country House in 1967. On September 25, 1972, Fleischer died from an artillery sclerosis of the brain, and, and the press announced his passing, Dean of Animated Cartoons. His death preceded the reclaiming of his star character, Betty Boo, with, and a national retrospective. The Betty Boo scandals of 1974 uh, started the Fleischer re Renaissance and with new 455 millimeter prints of a selection of the best prior Fleischer cartoons made between 1928 and 1934. This was followed by the Pop Popeye Follies. These special theatrical programs generated interest in Max 
uh, Fleischer as an alternative to Walt Disney, spawning a new wave of film research devoted to an expanding interest in animation beyond trivial entertainment. In 1954, Max's son, Richard Fleischer, was directing 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for Walt Disney. This brought about an honorary luncheon which united Max and his former competitor and reunited, reunited him with a number of former Fleischer animators who were employed by Disney. This meeting of the former rivals seemed cordial and Max remarked that he was very happy making educational films at the point in his career. However, in his collection of memoirs entitled Just Tell Me When to Cry, Richard Fleischer relates how at the mere mention of Disney's name, Max would mutter, that son of a bitch. <laughs> By the way, there's a, a side story to that real quickly. <clears throat> I went to, to, uh, to um, California and met Walt Disney in, in, when I was about 15 years old. My dad became very friends, good friends with Ray Bolger, the scarecrow. Played golf with him a number of times. Terrific guy. Edwin Wynn and Keenan Wynn were there. And that Funicello, which just got me. <laughs> and, I, yeah. and I got a chance to talk to Walt Disney, and of course he had this great interest in kids, so he was talking to me as a 15-year-old. And I've got pictures of it, it's very, very cool. Anyway, so um, uh, what, what happened was uh, when Richard Fleischer was asked by Disney to direct 20,000 Leagues, because of the conflict between uh, Max and Walt, uh, Richard said, how can I work for Disney Studios? So he went to his dad and he said, uh, he did, I've been asked by Disney Studios to do a movie. What do you think? He says, take the gig, is exactly what he said. <laughs> take the gig, you're going to work for Disney, for crying out loud. That son of a bitch. <laughs> 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 All right, moving on. Fleischer won his lawsuit against Paramount in 1955 over the removal of his name from the, uh, from the credits of his films. While Fleischer had issues over the breach of contract, he had avoided suing the decade, as we said. He revived out of the wake up films. He partnered with his former animator, Hal Seeger, as I said, and he had his, his ownership of the Kaifer studi Studios, which was uh, what he wanted to do. Uh, prior to so showing several of the films, I will answer the question Apple Max posed when he met me in 1957. The reason it is colder at the top of a mountain than it is at the base is because although the sun radiates the earth, it does not warm the atmosphere. The radiation heats the earth into the far infrared, which in turn heats the atmosphere, making the earth the source of the heat for the atmosphere. Thus, the top of the mountain is farther from the heat source than its base. Hence, you have a colder mountain at the top. And that did the job, as it were. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I've got several films now that I'm going to show about uh, that, that he did. And uh, there, there's some sound attached, hopefully. And uh, we'll just take a look at some of the things that he did. <laughs> Obviously, this is a very early film. By the way, he did meet Albert Einstein. I found out from Ray Burke. Ray Burke. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
Limbo to Mars. Hopefully it'll work. Okay. This is 1930. See Dave Fleischer in the bottom there. That is not Mickey Mouse, by the way. It really isn't? Uh, You can hear the first remnants of sound introduced with the...
All right, I'm going to move to the last one since we're running out of time. Um, the last one I want to show you is, uh, this was the first production of uh, Superman. And uh, this is the first one. And uh, watch a little bit of it and then any questions. Fleischer uh, uh, passed away a few years ago at the age of 89 as well. 
So um, uh, it was again fun to do, and he was an interesting character, as you can tell, and very innovative. Yes. And uh, again, I really enjoy your attention, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Questions at all. We're really tight on time, so one or two quick ones. One or two ones. questions, anything you want, it's okay. All right, yes. Uh, the one thing I saw in relativity, it was Galilean relativity, not Einstein's relativity. Again, you're talking he about a time period. Minutes where, minutes you, know, you wanted to explain things, you wanted to explain Darwin and everything else like that. Thanks very much. If you have any questions, you can certainly come up afterwards.